Hi everybody, we're going to be working on our new project. It's going to be the Brick Breaker Project. <laughs> it's an old classic game. Um, and we talked about it in class, so I won't talk about it too much here. Uh, I was going to say that um, the main goal of this project is to integrate what we've already been learning about processing uh, in games like the mode framework and collisions and with object-oriented programming. And the big question is, how do we get objects to know if they collide with each other? So that's what we'll do. We'll start off by just making our uh, basic foundations for our project. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and do a void setup, void draw, Ooh. and we're going to make the mode framework. So I'm going to have an int mode, which will keep track of what mode our game is in. Uh, we're going to make the size to some default size. For now, uh, one of the goals that we're going to try to uh, achieve is making our sketch uh, more flexible so that if we were to later on resize these numbers, uh, our sketch wouldn't need reprogramming. So stay tuned for that. I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, so for our mode, we probably want to start it off at you know the intro screen mode. Uh, we've been doing things like this and using a single number for the mode. It's not great, actually. It's uh, it's hard to remember, when, especially when we get more modes than just four or five. Uh, it's going to get to be quite complicated where you have 37 modes and you're wondering which is 14. You know, it's just going to be difficult. So a good trick uh, to make this work, and I don't know about trick, but good coding practice is probably the better word, is to uh, code up some words to represent those numbers. So you can make int intro equal one and int uh, playing equal two and int pause equal three int win equal four int lose equal five and so on uh, the goal here is now i can use the word intro and i'm still setting mode to one but i don't have to remember which one was intro because it's easier to remember a word than some arbitrary number. Intro means intro. This has even more benefits when we go to do our draw uh, function and break it down into the mode framework. So if we want to you know, rough that out right now, mode double equals to compare it. If mode equals intro, then do this. And then else, if mode equals playing. You know, these if statements read like uh, English, you know, if mode else if mode equals playing, else if mode equals pause. This is going to help you make fewer mistakes in the long run, and that's uh, always a good thing. Also, in software engineering, you'll learn later on. Uh, right now, our projects are pretty small, but as we get into larger scale projects, uh, generally they're made by teams, and teams need to be able to communicate effectively. You need to be able to read each other's code. And if your code is more readable, your code is better code. Many, almost all organizations that are well run anyways, require their coders to code this way. Uh, okay, so they have a final else, it's just a catch, like, oh, what happens if our mode gets set to uh, 99 or something? It would be hard to check that error down. So I'll just put in a just print line uh, mode error or something, just to give me a sign that that's the thing that happened. There's another problem though, uh, these are variables playing, pause, win. Uh, if I was to accidentally say like win plus plus or something, then win would then now be the same value as lose. And so when we lose, we would win. And when we win, we would lose. And it would be really confusing. So we can actually lock these variables by putting the keyword final in front. If I write final in front of the variable declaration, I am locking it. It cannot be changed ever after. I can still change it here. I could be like, well, it's equal to zero, actually, or whatever. But during the running of the program, nothing can change those variables. So we won't accidentally get into those weird situations where win becomes lose, and lose becomes win, and, and all that kind of stuff. OK, so there's our mode framework. I'm going to cough, sorry. <coughs> uh, and then we're going to go make some tabs. I'm going to make the basic structure that you're familiar with with our project. Make a new tab. Oh, let's call this uh, you know one for each mode. So intro. 
playing stars <laughs> All right, and these are just going to be the homes of the functions that we're going to call from here. Uh, so, for example, in this if statement, if mode is intro, we're going to call the intro function. If mode is playing, we'll call the playing function. If mode is pause, we'll call the pause function. And if mode is win, we'll call the win function. And if mode is lose, we'll call the lose function. And we'll go ahead and, you know, put those in the various tabs. Hey, do you remember why we're doing this? The reason is because if you were to code all of the playing stuff in this space and all of the win stuff in this space and all the lose stuff and so on, it would just get to be very messy and very hard to read. And honestly, once this mode framework is done, we don't really need to touch it anymore. It's done. It's good. So we can just kind of lock that in, and now we're going to have these individual tabs where we can program those different uh, artifacts, those different modes. So I'll make void intro in the intro tab. I'll make void lose in the lose tab. Void pause in the pause tab. Void playing in the playing tab. Oh dear. Play ig, play ing. And void win in the win tab. Just an organizational um, strategy so that our code is going to be manageable and readable. Uh, make fewer mistakes, so that's good. Okay, there's our mode framework. Normally I would now go and test this, uh, but I won't for the video. Uh, but a good way to test it is just to set your mode to intro, and then uh, put a background color like background uh, 25500. Red. Make it a distinct one. Then I would run it. I guess I'll do one just to demonstrate. Hey look, it's red. I guess the mode framework worked for intro. I would then go and change it to well, the next one is playing. In the playing mode, I'd give it a distinct background color here and run it and see if I get that distinct background color. And then I know that you know these functions are getting called and I know that my mode framework is working. And if you do get an error, you know check to see if you see print uh, mode error printed down here. Uh, check your if statements, make sure you don't have semicolons at the end of them. All that kind of stuff uh, is is important. Okay, so there you go. That's the first start uh, of the project. It's uh, just a framework. It's just the mode framework. But now we're going to combine the mode framework with object, which is sort of our big new thing. And that's uh, not going to be extremely difficult compared to what we've been doing, but there is a bit of a changeover as to how it's going to work. So I'm going to go ahead and make uh, a new tab. Here's a tip. You'll notice that, um, I don't think I can zoom in. Yeah, I can, I think I can zoom in. <laughs> there we go. Uh, you'll notice that my, our tabs are alphabetized, so it's going to get a bit messy. What I like to do is lowercase, uh, use lowercase letters for the mode tabs, and then uppercase letters for the uh, the uh, object tabs, uh, because in <laughs> computers, uh, capital letters and lowercase letters, there's an order to them. The capital letters come before all the lowercase letters. So, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> it will allow us to, uh, you know, group together either the mode tabs versus the uh, object tabs. So I'm going to make some new tabs. We're going to be making Brick Breaker, right? So we're going to need a few things. We're going to need a ball. And we're going to need a paddle. And we need a brick. We'll need many bricks, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Okay, so the ball tab, let's go and make a ball. This is basically a target. It's going to bounce off of the paddle as well. Well, we've done this quite a bit, right? We did a target clicking game. We did Pong. So this is going to be very similar. And if you want a bit of a challenge, um, you know, most of you already have done this in class. But if you're watching this for the first time because you were away or whatever, you might want to just pause the video and go see if you can code up the ball class on your own. I gave the students in class a bit of time to do that. But if you are you know, wanting to see how it goes, or you've already done that, and you want to see what the answer is, here it comes. So here is the class ball. So the class has three different things. It has uh, instance variables. That's the information that each ball has to remember. And we're only going to have one to start with, but theoretically, later on, that's a classic 
part of Brick Breakers to get multiple balls, so you know, we'll be set up for that. Uh, you know, this is just a standard float X and Y, VX, VY. You could get in some more detail later on if you want to. Uh, I think actually diameter might be a good variable to include. Uh, I'm going to use diameter. I think it'll be good. Okay, and now we need the second thing, constructor. Feel free to add more instance variables later on, by the way. We'll have the chance to add in extra features, so this isn't written in stone. Uh, our constructor is a special function. It uh, has no return type, so you do not type void. You avoid the void is the, is the mnemonic we've been using. And then you give the, the function's name the same as the class. So this and this have to match. And then the rest is just like a function. The purpose of a constructor is to initialize the instance variables. So I'll go ahead and set the x and the y values, and the vx and the vy, and the diameter of the ball. So this is where I'm going to talk a bit about how we're going to make this uh, sketch a little bit more flexible. So if we change the size, then we will um, you know, not mess up our project. So for example, if we wanted to start the ball in the center, 300 by 300, you know, that's great, but if we change the size later on, we gotta remember to come back here and adjust these numbers. So, oops, that's kind of annoying. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is instead of using 300, we're gonna use the built-in variables width and height. Width and height represent how long and wide, uh, how wide and how tall the screen is. So width, for example, would be the uh, first part of the size function, and height is the second part. They're both 600 in this case. If I want it to start in the center, I can just divide by two. So why is this better? The reason this is better is because if I go and type in, say, 700 over here, I just made a change, I just decided I wanted it wider. I don't have to go and reprogram this. This is still the center, no matter what I type in for the size. So, you know, a little bit of foresight into your programming and using these built-in variables, the variables that keep track of the size of your window, it's going to make your life a lot easier and allow you to experiment with different sizes and see what's right. Also, later on, if you do programming for you know uh, phones, for example, like a mobile app, not every phone has the same size screen. And so the ability for an app to resize itself to the size of the phone screen or even a desktop app on a computer, different computers have different size screens and such. So that's, uh, that's a very important aspect of uh, making those kind of programs. All right, so I'll just choose arbitrary VX and VY, just some numbers. Uh, and diameter, I'll choose uh, 50, no particular reason. I might change that later on. Okay, third thing is uh, behavior functions. And they are the functions that take care of whatever it is that these things do, this object. And of course, this is a ball, so a ball is going to uh, have a lovely uh, show function to show an ellipse. It's going to be an x and y. And have d is our diameter. And of course, we're going to have a act function. So the ball can act. And what does the ball do? It moves. We've seen this code many times this year, so I'll just type it in. Coding is hard when you're sick. <laughs> um, and then, of course, that's the move code. It's just updating our position with our velocity. And then we'll have our bounce code. So if x is less than, you could say less than zero, but if you wanted to bounce it on the edge, it would be like half the diameter. You could put in 25. But guess what? I'm going to put in d. Um, d is a float. Yeah, I did make a float. d divided by 2. And that way, uh, if I change the, the size of my ball, this if statement will not need updating. This will automatically work. If I make the ball 80, then this will work out to be 40. I won't have to type in a new number here. So it's very useful. Um, so if x is less, wait, did I say less than? Yeah, I guess we're greater than uh, width minus d divided by 2. This is just the same thing as saying 
you know, if your ball was 50 wide, you don't want to collide on, um, wait, sorry. If your ball is 50 wide and your sketch is 600 wide, you want to collide the ball at 550, because that's where the center would be when the ball, or five, I, I'm just going to stop talking. <laughs> so it should be 575. Uh, half of the, I'm just not doing a great job of that. Um, I'm going to just stick to, I think my health can only explain this. This is, this is probably a good place to start. This is, this is more familiar. Uh, hopefully it made sense as to why I would choose to, you know, bump it in by D divided by two and back it off by D divided by two, the half of the diameter. Um, uh, but if not, uh, <laughs> I'll talk to you in class about it. I'm not doing a great job at explaining it. Uh, but we do know how to bounce it. Uh, and then we have our other bounce for the top, and it's the same uh, thing, basically. <clears throat> Except it's height this time. Although, in our sketch, height and width are the same. But they don't have to be, so that'll be good. So we just reverse by and dx. Yeah. And so, great, we've coded up a ball class. And of course, I don't want of course. But that means that if we have a ball class and we're in mode playing, we should see a ball, right? But of course, we don't. And I guess I need some semicolons. Semicolons, useful. Yeah, we see nothing. Uh, and why don't we see a ball? In the past, when we coded this up, there were no problems. So the reason is because uh, we don't actually have a ball. Playing does uh, not a lot. There's nothing. So let's put in a background here. I'll just put in a background black. And that will be fine. Uh, what I would like to do now is actually get the ball moving around. So we need to make a ball. We have a construct, oh, so we have a blueprint for a ball. That's what a class is. This is a blueprint. Uh, another way to think of it is it's a cookie cutter. But that doesn't mean, just because you got a cookie cutter, doesn't mean you got cookies, right? Just because you have a blueprint, of a, I don't know, whatever, a car. <laughs> it doesn't mean you have a, you could drive the blueprint, right? You can't sit in a piece of paper and drive around. Uh, so we actually have to build the ball from this blueprint. And the way you do that is up here. Uh, this is our global variable space, right? These are the variables that are accessible everywhere in our program, in every function, in every tab, you name it. So what I like to do is make uh, a ball variable. And in the past, we've done this with, um, you know, we've done it with arrays, and that was fine. But if you just have one ball, you don't got to go make a fancy array. You just make a ball variable. Just like you make int x. <clears throat> What's the pattern here? You have the variable type and the variable name. So what we're going to do is make a ball variable. Ball is the type, and the name will be my ball, which is a convention that we talked about in class. Uh, my ball is um, right now nothing. It's just a variable that can hold a ball. It currently holds no ball. So we have to go and call the constructor. We do that in the setup, probably. I guess it could go in other places, but uh, we'll do it here for now. So my ball equals new ball. Hey, there's me calling the ball constructor. Ooh. So now that actually a ball exists. But guess what? Just because it exists doesn't mean it does anything. Uh, back ground is spelled with a G. It exists, it's in the computer's memory, but we're not telling it to do anything. So over in the playing function, I gotta go and make the ball act and show. So we can say my ball dot show. My ball dot act. There it is. Run that. We get some lovely ball moving. And you're gonna say, possibly to yourself, wow, that's a whole lot of work to make a target clicky game. We got ourselves like, you know, like, well, I don't know, was that eight tabs, nine tabs? Uh, you know, lots of stuff going on here, more complicated than our original target clicking game, and all we got is this. But you know what? This foundation is really strong. It's gonna allow us to move forward effectively. Okay, so I'm gonna pause the video there, stop the video, and you can tune in for the next video on how to make the paddle uh, and the collision would be the important thing.